Hello there. Uh, just before we go any further, uh, I just want to say thank you so much to everybody that has signed up to our Patreon. Pa- pa- Patreon? Patron? Patreon. Patron. Pa- Patron. Are we patronizing? Uh, you can buy some Patron. Uh, yeah. We've all gone out and got shots of Patron to celebrate our <laughs> newfound success. But no, really, uh, I don't know why we didn't do it sooner, um, but it's been really helpful. And uh, yeah. what it means is that we now can cover our costs. Yeah, we are no longer doing this and spending money, our own money, on it, uh, which is great. We're not making any money, um, but we're not doing it to make money. Uh, but it is very, very lovely that we can. Uh, we're doing it to hear our own voices. Yeah. <sighs> well, yeah, exactly. Um, I saw I saw somebody on Twitter, uh, a comedian, uh, say the opposite of uh, International Women's Day is International Podcast Day. <laughs> and uh, Or no, it was the other way around, because I, I think today is International Podcast Day. It was yesterday, the 30th oh, of yeah. September. And they said the opposite of International Podcast Day is International Women's Day. And I thought that was very good. It's very uh, diminishing uh, for all the women that do podcasts. Well, yeah, it? exactly. I mean... Of which there are many and great. Anyway, uh, enough of that. Um, but we've got some specific humans to thank. Uh, and then, um, yeah, if you want to get involved and help us fund this, uh, go to our Patreon, patreon.com slash unsungpod. That's the place to go, yeah. Ding dong. Um, yeah, so 22 people donated to our Patreon over the course of, like, four days, which is amazing. So, as Dave said, we've not got enough money to cover the costs, and we can also do other things like make merch and stuff now, which is awesome. It's so another, what, another thing for us to argue about, it's yeah. great. Um, but I have 22 goddamn people to thank. Some of which we've thanked before, but they decided to, to pledge their entire life savings to us, so they should be thanked again. Brian Gallagher, Corey Robinson, of course our man Craig Carrick, um, Craig Scott, Dan O'Brien, David Muir, David Bright, Craig Love, Craig Corey, Hazel Burgess, who donated one sum and then decided to go even higher, which was very nice of her. Jason Simplicaios, um, I hope I've said your name right, Jason, I know we're friends, but you've never actually told me how you pronounce your surname, <laughs> so... <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Sorry. Um, Karen Taylor, Kevin Cameron, K- Kirsty Dickinson, Mike Shields, Nick Thompson, Race Bannon, who donated £50 a month, you fucking madman. <laughs> uh, Sadie, it just says Sadie, uh, Tim Russell and Will Hill. Uh, and if you have since donated, if you donated after Tuesday, the 1st of October, we'll see your name next week. <laughs> but yeah, thank you to every single one of you guys. Um, I really don't know what to say. Fucking. I said thank you. I think that's appropriate. Yeah, it's fucking awesome. Dream. Thank you. Awesome. Pay you back with improved content and mental stability. Exactly. Yeah. The, the more you give us uh, and the more people that sign up, the more super duper content will come your way. But yeah, thanks a lot. Thanks. All right, on with the Take podcast. show. Hello, welcome to the Unsung Podcast. Me and Chris both have colds. Dave, have you got a cold? <laughs> no, but... Uh, What's wrong with you? My it's fiance totally has had a cold in. for three days, so that means I will definitely get one. Yeah, it's a cool thing mm-hmm. to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, all the cool kids have one. I don't know if I'm a cool kid All anymore. the cold kids. I'm 33, <laughs> that doesn't count as kid. Although my club night got mentioned in some like online weekly listings and they said, uh, they called us youngsters. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're a combined age of, of 66 and there's only two of us, so I wouldn't say <laughs> youngsters. But thanks very much, random Glasgow blog. I mean, maybe uh, maybe they've listened to the music and gone, they must be children. <laughs> <laughs> I mean... Yeah, maybe not youngsters, but certainly immature. That's fine. Um, yeah, no, no arguments whatsoever. We actually had a, a club night, the three of us, last week, last yeah. weekend. That went well. We did. Had a lot of fun. Actually, it was knocked a lot out of the park, didn't we? Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Thought it'd be self- too self congratulatory, but we fucking smashed yeah. that. <laughs> Might have to do it again. Place was pretty bouncy. Yeah, you could barely move at one point. You should definitely come if you've not been before. <laughs> I mean, some of the music was horrible. Oh, yeah, some of it was deeply, deeply questionable. Really, stuff. really horrible. Deeply questionable. You've got to give the public yeah. what they want. And Apparently, the that is what they want, yeah. They want bad music. <laughs> Even if they don't know they, they want it. I've been DJing for 10 years and I know this. <laughs> Feed them shit. Uh, but yeah, bangers ahoy. Bangers ahoy. We should, yeah, well, yeah. we've got a couple of things in the pipeline as we approach Christmas and we'll announce them in due course anyway. Mm-hmm. And on the back of our recent shift to Patreon, as we mentioned, uh, things are self-sustaining, which enables us to push the boat out in a couple other ways. Thank you very much. And we can increase the push the boat out in even more elaborate ways. Uh, So if you're not 
on Patreon. We'd really appreciate it if you would do that. And we will use the independence this has now given us to try and facilitate mad new things. So we've been talking for about five minutes now, but we haven't mentioned politics once. What's going on? I think we can skip. Oh, we've given up completely this week. Who the fuck knows? Who cares? I mean, they're just doing what they want. Yeah. Politics uh, is cancelled. I'm going to hit the cancel button. Oh, buzzer. that's done. <laughs> oh, you've actually got the button. I forgot about that. <laughs> yep. Yeah. I mean, so, fuck it. Fully just glazed out. Uh, yeah, you've got a thousand yard uh, stare of politics. <laughs> Any time anyone mentions it, I go catatonic. Yeah. I just stop. I'll recover. Yeah. I'll get my wind back maybe by next week, but I'm just, um, I'm burnt out. Uh, fatigued a wee bit by post metal as well, I'll be honest. Um, I mean, yeah, a whole week of it. So <laughs> is this only our. S- s- so uh, we should mention what record we're doing. Uh, we're doing uh, Cult of Luna and somewhere along the highway. <laughs> Is this only our second post metal record after Shells? Mm, yeah, I think yeah, it probably yeah, is. Yeah, arguably, mm. and probably our first like classic post metal band. Yeah, Shells yeah. being a bit of an under the radar one. It's mm. interesting to have your normal week soundtracked by such intense and unrelenting music. I don't know what you're talking about. This is literally what I've listened to for <laughs> 15 years. <laughs> like, this is completely normal to me. It's just, I mean, it is a little. Odd, dramatic. To just be doing day to day stuff, sometimes even quite light hearted stuff, uh-huh. and have in the background some Scandinavian guy screaming for twenty minutes <laughs> over a kind of forty BPM backing track. Mm-hmm. But it puts things in a different light. This is how I live my life, Christopher. Did, did you, uh, obviously, we record this in my house, and I, I for the time being, for the time being, for we're the time being in the studio until thanks we hit to the you guys. Time. Yeah, and I share this house uh, with my flatmate. Uh, quite eccentric Italian gentleman called Luigi and <laughs> as a result his week has also been soundtracked by Cult of Luna <laughs> just been enjoying that proximity and volume I think it's taken its toll on him <laughs> 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 he didn't have the best of weeks as it is oh, man. I mean for anybody that's ever met the record producer uh, Luigi Pasquini they'll they'll know what a character he is anyway mm-hmm. but uh, just very quickly if you can set this to Cult of Luna, it's especially funny. But um, at some point this week, he went into a Subway chain sandwich restaurant to get a quick salad for lunch. And it was 1pm in one of the busiest streets in Glasgow. So there's like commuters and workers and all this kind of stuff going on. And he got his salad and he went to like the wee drinks machine and mm. he kind of felt something on his head didn't pay any attention to it and then something bit his neck and he started flapping his arms about like crazy and everybody in the sandwich shop is just looking at this bearded very odd looking Italian man flapping about holding a salad um, he puts the salad down because he thinks there's a fly or a mosquito mm-hmm. then he feels wee legs on his back running down inside his shirt <laughs> then he starts yelling then he feels wee legs running down into his trousers oh my <laughs> fucking hell <laughs> and he starts just Absolutely freaking out in the middle of a sandwich restaurant. Nobody knows what's going on. They just know that a guy went to get a drink from the juice machine. <laughs> and now he's like freaking and jumping about. And he is literally flopping about. He runs out the front door. <clears throat> and in the middle of the street at one in the afternoon with everybody about, he starts pulling all these clothes off. <laughs> Rips off his shirt, his top. Takes off his trousers down to his ankles till he's just standing in his pants. And he, very, he was telling me uh, he heard some group of tourists go by and go, Oh my god, look at that guy <laughs> <laughs> He's like slamming his clothes Off the pavement trying to kill what is. <laughs> And he's shut And all the staff and all the uh, customers Of the subway have gone to the window To try and watch this circus outside So set that to Cult of Luna and Brilliant That's uh, so. That's the weekend glass What was it? Did we find out? Uh, it was a spider bite. A spider. Is, um, it, is it bad? Yeah, he sent me photos of it. It was really ugly. Like, he got a really big welt. And he said after about two minutes, his whole neck started to burn, which I assume must have been... Fuck. Um, you don't really think of uh, poisonous yeah. animals in Scotland, but... No, uh, it's, it's strange, but that's yeah. uh, maybe global warming for you. Oh, well. Fake news. 
But uh, no, that was it was an interesting week, but that was one of my highlights. Great. Was getting that message bit by bit in text, <laughs> <laughs> in broken English, and then photos of this huge bite in his neck. And stuff. Fucking hell, just brilliant because oh, well. he can't do anything normally. He yeah. cannot do anything normally. Anything he does, no matter how routine, yeah, is a debacle. And when you accompany that with a week of post metal, it's yeah. Well, that's that's quite a journey. We just went on quite a journey there already. We've not even started talking anyway, about Cuttle yeah, yet. Let's, let's talk about let's talk about this band because they got a lot of stuff. And I think Dave, I suspect you've got a lot to say about this. Yeah, yeah. I mean, sometimes Chris, when you're going through bands' other albums, and I'm like, oh, I mean, this this bit only needs to be like three minutes because we're talking about the album we're on about. But I sat down at uh, about quarter to ten last night. And then by 20 past 11, I'd written 1,600 words <laughs> on all the other albums by Cult of Luna that aren't the album we're talking about. So, uh, you better get started. Oh, fuck, sorry, guys. Uh, tell us a bit about the band, then. Uh, so the band uh, are from a city called Umia, quite far north in Sweden. I understand it's prolific. It is prolific. So in actual fact, I was going to ask if you had any input on this. So it's a university town, but it's only about 120,000 population. Mm -hmm. So same sort of size as like Dundee Mm -hmm. uh, in Scotland or, you know, I don't know where in England, that sort of size. A very, very small... Very uh, small city. Place by by certainly by American standards. Yeah, exactly. Australian even. Um, But that also happens to be the city where Meshuggah come from Mm -hmm. and also refused. Uh, and a bunch of others yeah. as well But like I mean they're literally Three of my favourite bands Of all time Yeah I mean it's and not just A lot of bands It's a lot of good bands Yeah yeah exactly That are all And they're different But all have a very similar Maybe perspective And outlook And vibe to them Do you think maybe It's that thing though Where when the standard In a city is quite high It, it does f- Push the others on A wee bit Even if you're in Kind of disparate genres mm-hmm. I mean these are They're all sort of um, They were all around Around about the same time Right so yeah, so maybe when there is a certain base level of expectation to be a good band in that city, someone sets the bar high. It does bring better, more out in you. Because I mean, I know I see it when but when bands come to Glasgow. There are some cities that bands come from where you reliably know that there's a very good chance the standard will be slightly better. Yeah, no, it is interesting. Um, it's a university town as well. And then I also, well, I was thinking the Cult of Luna have done interviews and. So the other bands that have talked about Umi and how prolific it is, and they've mentioned that it's like dark winters uh, and things like that, so they've got nothing else to do. But then I was looking at sort of other cities that have maybe been as prolific, and one I, well, I don't know, I just thought of it, and I think it's because I actually drove through it about 15 years ago, was uh, Athens in Georgia. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a good uh, one, good show. In the States. And uh, Athens has got to be bigger than that, though. No, it? it's not. Same. Oh, it's really? about 130. Okay. Uh, and there you've got the likes of REM, REM, B52s. B52s, Neutral Milk Hotel of Montreal, you know, groundbreaking bands all in their own way. Yeah. Uh, and a whole load of others. And Georgia itself is like a state that really produces a lot of bands. Yeah, a lot of metal. A lot of metal. A lot of sludgy metal. A lot of hip hop. Yeah. Athens, Georgia doesn't have long Swedish wintery nights. So it's interesting to see what those cities have in common. Hot, insufferably balmy days, mm. I believe. Yeah, definitely. Well, if you're listening yeah. and you can think of a small but insanely prolific town, uh, please chip in and maybe we can do an episode and something like this at some point. Because that is quite an interesting idea. That would be lovely. I like the fact that they're not big towns. Even like, you know, Glasgow's ridiculously productive in terms of high profile bands, but yeah. it's half a million. So Yeah, and I was I was looking at like people were asking, Oh, what cities produce the best bands? And they were like, Oh, what about LA or New York or London? It's like I you, you get a kind of free pass for that. I mean, obviously. And the bands, bands. tend to migrate there. That, yeah, exactly. To They're like hubs. It. Yeah. Um but yeah, it'd be really interesting to Think of some other cities that are knocking it way out of the park in terms of. I think I think one is Bristol. I was actually going to say Bristol as well. Yeah, Bristol yeah. was outrageously good for bands and music. It's a university town. A um, lot of artists. Probably having an art school there is probably something that you'd find is very maybe. Yeah. It's the same size as Glasgow as well. Is it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So again, I suppose that's that's near half a million. So anyway, cut Luna though. Long Swedish winters. That's what this sounds like. Yes, I think a lot of their music definitely reflects sort of Scandinavian nature and 
also a sort of personality as desolation. well. Desolation. Desolation. It's a bit like when we did the Black Metal episode. I guess it's a, a variation or an interpretation of the scenery and the climate and the, uh, the isolation mm-hmm. to some extent. Um, so, Cult of Luna, they've just released their eighth record. Mm-hmm. Um, when were they formed? Because were they not in 1998? So they used to be in a, a sort of hardcore punk band called Eclipse. Uh, or at least a few of the members did and then in 1998 that band fell apart Cult of Luna got together and you can certainly hear on their um, first two records that sort of hardcore influence I mean you think of Cult of Luna now and their contemporaries of you know Isis uh, and then Pelican Neurosis. Russian Circles who all took a lot of influence from Neurosis mm-hmm. but uh yeah, to begin with, those first records, although they had the long songs and the progressive song structures, the actual sound was like, they turned everything up. They were it was fucking, you know, heavy as fuck. Yeah, so, I mean... They the, were a hardcore metal band. I feel like their first record, I, I don't it's not one-dimensional, but it's certainly a lot more to the point and, you know, shorn of, like, adventures and elaborate ideas. just a it's much dimmier and heavier and sludgier and yeah it's like it's got some really you know big chuggy riffs which you know they're very good at just the production is like everything's turned up to the max um i I would have loved to have seen it live back in the day you know when they did that sort of stuff Mm -hmm. um going back to listen to it it's pretty hard to listen to constantly just because it's so intensely heavy and unforgiven for like you know an hour it's also a sound that was very much easier to imitate and I think has been uh, replicated by a lot of bands subsequently because the sound that Cult of Luna had on the first album, the self-titled album was much more basic and mm. I think you hear a lot of like post-metal filler bands you know, the bands that came five years after and that's what they sound like. They don't necessarily sound like Neurosis because Neurosis were a lot more experimental and adventurous and kind yeah. of like proggy almost and Isis, there was a kind of production value to Isis that was quite hard to imitate, but with Cult of Luna you could just get loud and just do these huge instrumentals and these kind of very straight timings mm-hmm. and just be be bombastic So that sound, I think, is dated as a result of the things that came after it. Yeah. Because there's so much of it that you could probably do a Pepsi challenge with it now and actually struggle to pick it out from all the bands that have ripped it off. Um, and I think, to some extent, that's also true um, of the Beyond, the second album. Which is a little bit more adventurous, but it's really relentless, really dense. I kind of feel like that period of the band as well lacks a bit of humanity, you know? Well, yeah, that's exactly it. I think, like, they don't really play any tracks from those first two records anymore live. And after the second record, there was a tiny little bit of a lineup change, um, new drummer. Um, but what there also was... Um, like a big sort of aesthetic and Man. atmosphere change. Absolutely. So I, this is it's really good that you picked up on that as well because obviously the biggest, the, the main note I had on that was mm-hmm. there is a big aesthetic shift in Cult of Luna after the Beyond. Yeah. And one of the ways it's illustrated literally is in their cover art. Definitely, yeah. They shifted mm-hmm. from this very kind of cold, digitised, almost like somewhere around, you know, like Static X. Uh, incubus type computer generated sort of mo- modified photography they shifted to this very analog drawn earthy sort of graphic designy stuff that mm-hmm. just seems uh, uh, like analog it's just a lot well more they've analog. had the same artist now uh, doing stuff since salvation uh, I'm pretty sure 
but like the production of the records, like the actual, you know, the sound design of those albums ties in with the it visual does. design it does. really well. And, and it's like much those, better. It's yeah, much, it's much, much more better. rewarding. And it's much more... It's, it ages um, better. It's aged, it's aged a lot better. Yeah. Those first two records definitely sound like they're... Yeah, they're progressive and yeah, they're interesting. There's some really good tracks on them, but like overall as pieces of work, they're like late 90s, early 2000s, heavy as fuck albums that are not really worth dipping back into. Yeah, I, I sort of feel like they're quite a passive listening experience. Like you, you, you listen to them and you can admire moments of them, but it's very hard to get invested in them because there is that lack of humanity, whereas from Salvation onwards, the third album... You, uh, you engage with the album a bit more you're drawn more into it and the lulls the highs and the yeah lows, there's a lot more space a lot more dynamic uh, there's a lot more dynamism in the mm. in the music and it, it just draws you into it more you're more within the performance rather than just standing watching it and that yeah it's, it's just really interesting how that's reflected in the art as well because it, it was very starkly apparent looking at the covers when you look at their discography it's like wow there's a big change mm-hmm. in the sort of message See, in there in the beyond that was the first time I'd heard them I think uh, I can't remember what track it was but it was on a Terrorizer uh, cover mount CD and that was the first time I heard them and like I did really like it I thought it was great it, there's like a lot going on they've got like in terms of at one time you know the, the guitars are still big they've got uh, they're into maximalism s- yeah in a big way um, you know the big sort of synth lines the more sort of interesting and jarring chords are coming in on the beyond but yeah they hadn't quite captured the essence of dynamics and less is more yeah I, I which think- is when they came to Adrift in 2004 less is more was like what they signed up to and it f- just fucking worked yeah, I mean, they hadn't really defined a sound of their own because this the sound of Cataluna is very much tied to to the highs and lows, very much tied to the loud and quiet, mm-hmm. uh, as opposed to some of the kind of more generic peers that they had. And I think it's what's given them that lasting appeal and given them a longevity in terms of where they could go with the music because they had much broader options avail- open to them. Yeah, without it sounding incongruous. Uh, so it was a good decision. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Early on, um, I mean, there were. <laughs> it's interesting. The Beyond came out was the year after Oceanic by Isis and the year before Panopticon. So like Isis had like sort of worked on that much more dynamic and spacious sound, I think, particularly with Panopticon, which came out the same year as Salvation. Isis had gone from basically a sludge metal band to defining a sound. Um, so Cult of Luna definitely owe a lot to Isis, but then they kind of took that quiet bit from Isis, the still maintaining that heavy bit of neurosis, and then just added a huge amount of personality. And as we're talking about, you know, like that sound design and the aesthetic design, and from Salvation onwards, that's when they really became a very unique thing within post metal and you know one of the i don't know touchstones of the genre themselves rather than sounding like other Mm. bands i mean i I don't disagree with that but one of the things i would say in addition to that is that neurosis are a very analog band Mm. so neurosis are ostensibly a metal band but their sound is is sometimes almost as though you took tom waits and set them to like you know yeah 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 with with some kind of like mashuga-esque backing band you know and i think that's one of the interesting appeals in neurosis and cult of luna and their move towards that much more analog human sound i think they took cues of that from neurosis as well yeah Yeah. neurosis get very heavy but there's so much more to them than that yeah absolutely they're they're a band that use a lot of tribal things they use a lot of ambience they've got the kind of tribes of neuro side project with you know all the drone and stuff like that i think that sense of experimentation influenced them as well Mm -hmm. not being too confined by the parameters of being perceived as a metal band isis to me even though i had a lot of time for them i don't think they've aged particularly well and i find them a lot more predictable yeah than i do the yeah, likes definitely. of neurosis or even cult of luna yeah i uh, no, you're right like i go back to isis and like i loved Oce- oceanic when it came out but i think it was like it was more about they found a really good sound but the actual songs themselves haven't necessarily s- yeah. stood up i really it sounds I more like primi- primitive yeah it? it sounds yeah. more primitive they haven't expanded on it in the way cult of luna did uh panopticon i thought was a good record 
kind of a bit tool y like mm-hmm. in that dimension. And then their last two records I just really didn't enjoy at all. And I think I mentioned before when we were talking about post metal, I went to see Pelican and Isis uh, about 10 years ago when I was over in Boston and Isis were on last but Pelican blew them out of the water uh, because Isis were just fucking boring they just sounded like a metal band playing long boring songs yeah I mean I think Isis did sound like a band that ran out of ideas a wee bit Mm -hmm. um so I think it's probably true in terms of like uh, ISIS because well, clearly Aaron Turner who's like one of the main guys has moved on to the Sumac and uh, has been obviously doing stuff with Old Man Clem as well which kind of pushes heaviness in completely different ways in different territories like Sumac aren't the heaviest fucking band I've ever heard in my life mm-hmm. Legitimately, just like outrageously heavy, and there's only three of them, and they make more interesting music than the guys in Isis did. Yeah, for my I mean, anyway. maybe maybe the lineup change, the, the completely different perspectives and input probably helped because I mean, Old Man Gloom are another band. I think they're excellent, man. I find them a lot more interesting than ISIS. Mm-hmm. Um, they they seem less constrained by expectation. You know, the, the, their their horizons and their variations within their music are a lot more. Well, it's interesting. Like a, lot a band like ISIS sort of became like icons for post metal while they were still a band, and after Oceanic and Panopticon. And I wonder how much that pressure affected them, but then also like being looked up to. It's maybe it's not quite a pressure, but it's like a. An expectation of greatness and that's something which I think Tool have fallen into like they know that they are expected to put out a stunning record and then they maybe just kind of rest on their laurels a bit while they're that band yeah and you know so I think ISIS yeah, they, put they out, seem scared to fail yeah rather than eager to yeah know, exactly do something else that's totally groundbreaking and it's interesting that talking about that that Cult of Luna are now on their eighth record, which is probably, you know, it's the sixth album of Cult of Luna, as we know, that sounds like Cult of Luna, really. And have you had a chance to listen to it yet? Of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've listened to everyone, yeah. Um, just because it, it only came out, like, a week ago. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, uh, no, I, I, I listened to it quite a bit, yeah. But, um... I mean, I don't... I, I, cards on the table here, I, I, uh-huh. I don't think Cult of Luna are immune to missteps, and I certainly don't think... They've always been full of fresh ideas. I think a, a couple of their albums in, in you know, are, around about the middle period suffer uh, from being a little bit uniform. Mm-hmm. Um, although Salvation, the third album, is certainly not one of them. In fact, if anything, the criticisms I saw levelled at Salvation was that for, for a lot of fans, certainly the fans that were into their really, really unrelentingly heavy early stuff, mm-hmm. it was too into its sort of lulls it was too into its uh, patience some said it was almost too patient a record and that when it was waiting for its big build ups it really milked it I like that about it. I think that's actually a yeah, I think, really, I think really rewarding feature of the album. Yeah, yeah. and it, for me, no, I mean, I, I think I, I think I do agree that, that this is um, that somewhere on the highway is a better record. But I do think Salvation runs it close. Um, I was I was torn, but I knew I'd made the right decision last night when I was like going through track by track, and it just felt. I mean, I'll talk about it a little bit more, but like. I just, Salvation is a brilliant turning point for the band and I go back to it and it's got some amazing tracks on it Echoes comes in and it's like just this really beautiful oh hey we're a totally different band now starts off quietly Um, so quiet compared to the first two records it's all, it's like four minutes until the drums come in and then it's still a big build up until like finally it's like five and a half minutes until that big fucking riff kicks in uh, 
uh, Vague Illusions is uh, probably one of the best Kilt Luna tracks. Just a really stunning crescendo, shows exactly what they do best. Leave Me Here is like maybe one of their most played live and online, I think. It's like another total stunner. That beautiful little guitar line after the big fucking chugs. That's like something that we'll talk about on somewhere along the highway that they're just so good is this little chorusy, echoey riff that sh- shimmers through, and then a drift is my favourite cut of Luna track that's not on somewhere along the highway. I think just because at one point it breaks down halfway through, and it's just a bass chug and a slow drum beat. It's just oh, so fucking good, so fucking good. I think that record, it's beautiful until the end, but I actually think it's a bit top heavy. I think the first half is much better than the second half. There's like really good bits in the second, like the last three tracks, but overall, like the first five tracks are such a fucking stunning statement of a band saying, This is us, this is our new sound. Fucking incredible, but the record just isn't quite as cohesive, well, as as balanced as it could be. Um, uh, it's am- am- I, amazing to think there's only one year, a year, a year and a half. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Like, I mean, that's yeah. like a that it, it, that's prolific, but also a lot happened in that space of time. Yeah, musically within this band. Well, interestingly enough, I think three members of Cult of Luna are also in a band called Coma, a sort of side project. But that came out in 2006 as well. And then, yeah, Salvation had been recorded, and then Somewhere Along the Highway came out in 2006 as well, same time as that, as Coma. So, a hugely busy period for the band. Yeah. They didn't um, just get a new drummer either, they added a keyboard player too, yeah. for Salvation. So, like, yeah. some monumental change in sound for yeah, so, in that short period of time. So, I guess in a nutshell, they went from this doomier early phase very quickly into this much more grandiose and sort of adventurous kind of second phase. Um, I also think it's the, it's the period, especially around Salvation, where they most regularly drop, you know, they've dropped from doom to post-metal, I think we would mm-hmm. call it. But in this album on Salvation, they, they actually drop from post-metal just into post-rock. Post-rock, like, there's yeah, definitely, definitely little definitely. bits. Yeah. And also on Somewhere Along the Highway, but yeah, there's little guitars that are Explosions in the Sky-esque. Mm. Yeah. Mm. But rather than make a whole album out of it, they do 30 seconds of it. Thank fuck. <laughs> um, the Eternal Kingdom, 2008. Yeah. Where do you stand on it? I think it does everything more. They went back to being really heavy. Um, I really like it. I remember when it came out and I was like, in the midst of being a big Cult of Luna fan somewhere along the highway was the first record I really got into and then I think I got this while I was at uni in Sterling and got the CD straight up I think it dips a little bit in the middle there's a lull but I really like the aesthetic of it I really like the idea behind it you know that was about this the whole narrative of it came from a diary that uh, the singer had found in an asylum and he, he sort of you know went creatively from there um, there's some fucking really good tunes on it some really heavy bits, some really interesting bits I think, like Owlwood the first track is a total great start uh, Big Breakdown in the title track is really great uh, Ghost Trail is a track that splits a lot of people. For me, I think it's one of the best songs because they're trying something different and it's like breaks down and then goes fucking wild with all these guitar solos. I think the next two or three tracks are fine but it's a sort of mushy bit in that record and I'd say it's the first average bit at all from the last three records to me um, I would say and then it ends well I think uh, Following Betch Last is a f- fucking brilliant track um, actually I really like the track The Great Migration I really love the drums in that Uh, 
I thought that was like one of the standout moments on mm-hmm. it. Uh, and there's some really nice use of synth in that tune as well. Uh, Eternal Kingdom, like the title track, it's fine. Um, but one of the things that bothers me about Eternal Kingdom is the way the vocals are recorded and produced. Yeah. Um, I think they don't sit in the music nearly as well. It sounds a bit like a different genre. It sounds a bit more like a kind of doomier kind of mm-hmm. genre and less atmospheric, but they feel a little bit dry, a little bit exposed. Yeah. And as a result, some of the bits of the vocals I actually find quite cringy, you know, quite cringeworthy. Um, and so I, uh, the album overall, I felt, I had a bit of the ices about it and I felt it lacked a few ideas. The, the production is just a tiny little bit dry compared yeah, to the last two exactly. records. And, and I think when that stuff's dry, it can grate a yeah. wee bit. It needs the, it needs the ambience. Um, I also think in this record, you get to, a, you get, you can hear something building up or you can hear something dropping down or you can hear something coming in and they go to too many easy answers, yeah. which is on the better records, they don't, they do something that kind of... S- yeah, s- we'll talk about that on yeah. somewhere along the highway. There's like a few bits that they just take a turn that exactly. you're not expecting. And I, would, I feel Eternal Kingdom is just a bit safe yeah. in that respect. Um, uh, but, you know, Ghost Trail, for instance, is a song that kind of does everything that you expect. But for me, it works. And it's, see the it's, first a bo- time, it's a box ticker. It's a box ticker. Yeah. But see the first time I heard Russian Circles, and I think it was must have been Enter or maybe Station. That was a band that were just ticking the boxes because they were doing exactly what you felt was going to happen in terms of like the chord progressions mm-hmm. and the tapping, like the second and third records, maybe up to Geneva. They never really did anything that shocked you. But what it. they were doing was just so fucking good. I didn't care. I was like, this is doing exactly what I feel like it's about to do, but it does it so well that I'll, it's fine. See, that's, for me, that's why I never really clicked with Russian Circles until Empress. Yeah. I, I, was, yeah. I felt it was too predictable. I, I do remember listening to it, but like, ugh, there's something about it. It's done so well that I'm actually like, ah, fuck it, it's actually quite soothing for me I don't know <laughs> uh, how do you feel about Vertical because that was 2013 right uh, yeah that was when it came out uh, it just kind of put me off I just never got into it it was quite an unwelcoming album it's pretty dense it's it, very it, dense it lacks any it, it, not any but it lacks it uh, enough standout moments you know of features yeah so you can there's some really great things on it that are slightly more hidden the sweep's brilliant Yeah, the like, sweep's great. That synthy and then weird track. They also released the Vertical 2, which is like the sort of partner EP. Yeah, it's not the best. It's not the best, but there's a similar track to uh, the sweep called Light Chaser on that that is very sort of grandiose. I think one of the best tunes I've done, though, is on that uh, Mute Departure. Yeah. I think it's a total belter. Yeah, the synth work in that is really, really good. Really, really patient. And I think on that album... When he brings in those like really intense like, vocals, they work so much better. They just they add the weight. They mm-hmm. don't grate. They don't jar. They don't stick out. They they you're not embarrassed to play it to somebody. It's not a dry mean. record, like, no, exactly. like the, uh, the previous one. But what's interesting is that they've gone back to the slightly more dystopic, like futuristic themes, dystopian, dystopian, <laughs> uh, futuristic <laughs> themes uh, that are because you know it's based on Metropolis yeah. and yeah, Fritz Lang's film. Yeah. yeah, they you know they did say they wanted to take a step back from the personal and the the human element yeah. and go more futuristic, which is yeah. w- definitely what they've done. God damn, um, by the way, Mute Departure's got a huge ending as yeah, well. Yeah, 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 man. It's monstrous. Uh, you know, and so here's something. I had never fully paid attention to the 2016 record they did with Julie Christmas called Mariner. Yeah. It's fucking excellent. It's really good, Holy man. shit. It's like, so I mean, good. I don't know. I mean, I'd heard it a few times and it was good, mm-hmm. um, but it, I hadn't really given it the credit it deserves. Yeah. And if you're somebody that's listened to the band and for whatever reason, like me, not 
paid attention to this god damn you need to go back and yeah listen to this i album. mean this was actually maybe one that i was going to bring up as an unsung because it's not one that people uh, but maybe it's just too recent but like maybe just doesn't quite get the props it deserves Fuck, um, and it's really good um, um I mean, it's only five tracks long but they're all you know long yeah, they're long it's, um, it's an album's worth yeah the, but the, it's interesting that yeah so they're, they're on to their seventh record and what they do is they get Julie Christmas from Made Out of Babies and you know this New York uh, female vocalist to come in a total character as well yeah and she brings so much personality to things and that's I mean that's what they lacked maybe on Vertical was mm. personality but it's really interesting for a band to be like oh what do we need we're on album seven do we just sort of go down another literary route or you know what are our themes going to be and they go oh no fuck it we're going to add a whole new sonic element to the record and also a whole new personality to the band for that you know um era and it was really interesting that they did that and i can't think of too many bands that have done that also a whole new dimension because this is a band of dudes and then they bring in this this really strong female presence. Mm-hmm. And it, it was interesting watching interviews where she was talking about some of the shit she got from their like super fans, their old yeah. school metal fans. But how dare you come in and interfere with my man moment? My yeah, this yeah, is my yeah. band. Yeah, exactly. How, who are you coming in shrieking all over their music? And it was like that, that's fucking lame in the extreme. One of the things she does, and one of the things she lends this band. God knows they try from time to time, but they cannot fucking sing yeah, yeah, a good yeah. song. Like, see, when he sings, it's so fucking hammy and just doesn't work. And he also mm. just doesn't have an ear for a good melody. And Julie Christmas really does. Yeah. And when she sings, she has such a diverse voice because she, she, can, she can fucking absolutely shriek. She can sing, she can bark, she can shout, but she can like totally belt it out as well. And in tracks like Wreck of S.S. Needle... It's such a good example of their music with an excellent vocalist. I love like that some- song. Someone making so great, great melodic choices as well. She yeah. goes for unusual notes. She doesn't go for obvious. Well, that's exactly it. And like a band. No matter what band you are, you know, seven albums, eight albums into your career, you're still, unless you're really challenging yourself, you're still going to fall into the same sort of melodic tropes that you might always have. And like, I remember my ex-girlfriend used to fucking hate Idlewild because Roddy Wimble always used to just go back to his safe note. Yeah. But then you look at like, even like Deftones, who I still think are like producing some really good music, like this far into their career, you hear Chino... He still sounds. He's still doing the same you basic guess, yeah. notes. That's Chino, and that's what yeah she really adds to this band. Yeah, because her sensibilities are totally different from theirs. And, yeah. and to be honest, when it comes to singing, far, far, far superior. Yeah. Um. The the second track, Chevron, which I think they released as a promo from this as well. Yeah. It's fucking brilliant. It's such a good song. Like. much faster and more immediate and the way the way she uses a vocal whilst the music is still not it's not a massively uh, up-tempo song but the busyness of her vocal in this which is something they don't usually have Mm -hmm. it it makes it sound faster yeah and then and then that uh sickness the last track Like as another like sort of yeah. big sprawling epic like that they you know are well known for like the huge crescendo, but then her vocals and then she's got like a little repetitive line in it, and you're like, oh, that's just added something extra to something a band were really good at. Um, something that Russian Circles then did with uh, not for a full album, but they had uh, Chelsea Wolf yeah. and like. The thing yeah, it's is, interesting. I, and I think that's really good. The only thing is Chelsea Wolf is much more in keeping with Russian Circles sensibilities you know long yeah she just fits notes. straight in yeah exactly. she's not gonna add i like the challenge of working with julie christmas because she's yeah. she's a, do you know an unknown quantity did you know her thing. stuff before i've never heard her stuff before this no uh, made it a babies are really good the 
they, they're a definite candidate for a future episode yeah. mm-hmm. they're great um, and then I Don't to Fear which as you say came out very very recently my god it's got some fucking rave reviews yeah amazing yeah. reviews since it came out yeah a lot of people saying that it's the best record for a long time mm-hmm. um it's definitely, that, it's definitely better from Eternal and from Vertical. Yeah, I think it's really fucking strong, classic Cult of Luna. Is it as good as Mariner? I don't know. Time will tell. I think I have to digest it. I think people saying that this is their best album for a long time are giving Mariner... They're being a little bit unfair yeah, on it. Being yeah, being a little bit unfair on it. I think it's maybe their best purely Cult of Luna record yeah. for a long time. So, I, Like, I went, I properly listened to it at the weekend, driving into the hills in Loch Lomond on my own, full blast. I mean, that's perfect for it. Yeah. And, like, there's a couple of proper goosebump bits on it. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, the track-wise, like, um, the seventh track, Inland Rain, Yeah, the, the, there's a kind of slow-rising synth about 410 in that song that's totally majestic. really really beautiful touch uh, the track on that The Fall is just one of their best full stop yeah um, and the only in thing the lights I think uh, see one thing about five is fucking brilliant. One thing about the fall though that annoys me is it's in the same key as in Lindrain. Yeah, and I think when you're doing tracks this long, you need to try and differentiate between them. And it, if you're not paying attention, it runs out of it, and it's like it's just kept going from track seven. Mm-hmm. I think that was like a sequencing mistake on their part. But it's this very, very, very good song. The ending of, that, of the fall is fucking mighty, uh, and there's a dissonant guitar trick they use. And it, it seems like the opposite decision than they would have made in the past. And I think it's interesting that they're still coming up with inventive twists and what's an aging genre, not just an aging band. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's held back or there are just a lot of genre tropes that bands fall down on. Yeah, so I mean, this band's almost 20-year-old or 20-year-old, mm-hmm. in fact. It is 20-year-old. And they're still managing to, to, to be inventive within yeah. not just their setup, but like that genre that is so riddled with tropes because the thing about post metal more so than most genres is unless you're really thinking you're the, the potential would just fall into like yeah pat, just like, rehashing the same yeah, thing again well worn you know yeah uh, trends is just overwhelming um night walkers uh, the fourth track is is good it's a bit more old school yeah um but i think uh, some of the moments when it just feel a little bit overcooked and the the, the title track as well uh, is really slow it's moody, it's quite a mature sounding song for them and the bass tone is fucking outrageously good. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a really good record yeah. overall. It's, I think it's one that will probably grow and certainly the reaction to the reviews, reviewers has been mm-hmm. warm to say the least, like yeah. 9.4s, 5 out of 5s, things like that. Um, Mark, were you much of a fan of Cult of Luna before that? I'd never heard them before and uh, when I was listening to them over the course of the past week I wondered why I hadn't listened yeah. before. <laughs> yeah, because... Uh, they are tremendous. Yeah. yeah. I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed Somewhere Along the Highway. Uh, I agree with what you were saying about Salvation and Somewhere Along the Highway. Mm-hmm. I think it's very, very close. But this feels more considered 